Amen. The book of Acts, chapter number 9. I want to begin reading at verse number 10, just for the sake of reading it. Um, but there are some statements that I want to make uh, from verse, at least um, from verse number 5. And then we'll get into the text. The Bible declares, and there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he, Ananias, said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayed. And had seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming to him and putting his hands on him that he might receive his sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man, how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said to him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Amen. And Ananias went his way and entered, the, entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, that is, Paul said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus has appeared unto, uh, has appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, and has sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight, and be filled with with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received his sight forthwith, and arose, and was baptized. Our Father, speak to us by the revelation of the Holy Ghost. Give us open hearts and attentive ears. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let not every person come down, come down from this place frustrated. Give every person what they came here for. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name, yes, amen. Amen. I want to talk about the right way. The right way. The Apostle Paul gets a lot of credit uh, amongst, Christ, amongst those of the Christian faith because he is credited with either dictating or writing with his own hand uh, two-thirds of the New Testament. Half of the book of Acts is about the life and ministry of Paul. Some people even think that the, what Luke was trying to accomplish in pinning the book of Acts was uh, establishing the apostleship of Paul by comparing the ministry of Paul and the ministry of Peter. That as Peter was blessed of God to testify to the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Jewish audience yes. and performed miracles even to the raising of the dead, so was Paul blessed of God to preach the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to a more Gentile audience. Yes. And did miraculous things, yes, yes. even up to and including raising somebody from the dead. Yes. 
So it was Luke's, now some people think that it was Luke's idea, it was Luke's motivation to equate both the ministry of Peter and the ministry of Paul. <laughs> and these days, these days, Christianity in general loves to use the ministry of Paul and the writings of the Apostle Paul to establish for itself a ground upon which men and women should be saved. Now we enter into what is properly called soteriology, and that is the proper study of the Bible to arrive at one conclusion, and that is, how is a person saved? Hmm. Yes. How is a person uh, cleansed from his sins? And how does God want to become to? You have to establish for yourself first uh, that God does want to become to. That he does not simply want to exist outside of us. Uh, that he in fact wants relationship with us. That is the first thing that you establish. And then the second thing you establish is how exactly does God want us to come to him? Now in the Old Testament you will remember that there was a tabernacle and or a temple built and people had to present sacrifices, animal sacrifices, blood sacrifices before the Lord and they had to wash themselves and uh, present incense and burnt offerings before the Lord because that is how God wanted to become to. Yes. Yes. You were not simply going to choose your own way of coming to God and think uh, that God was going to be okay with that. Uh, because God provided and prescribed the methodology by which He wanted you to step before Him. Uh, this morning we talked uh, talk in very cursory fashion uh, about how the Lord wanted to become to it. He told the high priest over and over again, wash yourself uh, that ye die not. And don't forget to put the incense on the altar that you die not. You are not going to come to a holy God unless God tells you how to come to Him. Hallelujah. We don't get to choose how to come to God. Amen. It's God that tells us how to come to Him. Amen. So, what we've done is we've devised for ourselves across the landscape of Christianity a way to come to God that makes sense to us. So when God bring, when God comes down to our level, then we now have a way that we can deal with Him. Uh, we brought Him down to our terms. But the reason why we've done that, and the reason why we've done that is because we, Christianity in general, the reason why Christianity in general has done that is because we don't really want to believe in the miraculous. We, we can't really wrap our minds around something that God has to do completely on his own as an act of his sovereign will in order to bring about the salvation of any one person or any group of people. But we in the apostolic church believe exactly that. That God has to come into our very experience and do something both in us and for us that only he could do himself. So what then does any of this have to do with the scripture we just read? Because if our soteriology, if our methodology for coming to God is to be uh, trusted in, or we can have to have faith in the Bible, the Bible has to be consistent. The testimony of the apostles has to have integrity. 
You cannot do one thing and preach another. You cannot be baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost and then preach all you have to do is confess. I know I came for somebody's sacred cow today. That's all right. What you preach has to be consistent with your experience. Otherwise, there is a problem with the integrity of your sermon. Because eventually, somebody is going to ask you, well, how did you come to God? And they are going to want the same experience that you had, not the same experience that you preached about. You will remember that individual that you looked at before you came to the Lord. And you looked at their life, you looked at the power that God had given them, and you looked at the joy that was in their spirit and the joy that was on their face and you said to yourself I want what he has Amen. I want what she whatever it is they have bottle it and give it to me because that's what I want it did not matter what they were talking about out of their mouths what you wanted was what they had in their hearts. Whatever it is they were feeling in their hearts, whatever it was that was providing the joy out of their spirits, that's what you wanted. And you were willing to do whatever it took to get that same joy, to get that same peace that they had, to get that same fire that they had down in their spirit. There was some sort of spiritual jealousy that took over your spirit and made you go get it.
For as much preaching as happens on TV, and as much preaching as happens at all churches all over the place, somebody has got to preach a message that is consistent with what's in the book from Genesis to Revelation. Our doctrine is not pulled from one scripture over here and another one over there. We are not looking to prove a point with our Bible study, not in the apostolic church. What we are looking for is what has God already revealed and how can I live consistently with it. No, no, no. We are not trying to pull, uh, prove some sort of theological point with our Bible study. No, we are going after what God has already established and looking to make our lives consistent, if not a mirror image of what has already been established in the Word of God. And now I tell you that there are three uh, different baptisms in the Scripture. Three and three alone. The first was the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. And uh, John baptized Jesus, the Bible says, to fulfill all righteousness. Now, uh, do we baptize people to fulfill all righteousness? No, because we are not Jesus. I don't mean to be a smart aleck about it, but that's just the truth. If you're Jesus, then please go get baptized to fulfill all righteousness. The second baptism was the baptism of John, and that was the baptism of repentance. Mark this scripture down. It's Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 19, Paul sees a group of, the apostle Paul sees a group of people uh, in, over the coast of Ephesus who have been uh, baptized into John's baptism, the baptism of repentance. And Paul asked them a simple question, and that is, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Have you spoken in the language of heaven since you believe in the God of your salvation? Amen. 
did. Amen. Jesus died, rose again, walked and talked with his apostles and his disciples for an additional 40 days. They saw Jesus go up into the clouds and they were in the upper room praying and praising the Lord for 10 days. And on the 10th day, which was the day of Pentecost, the Lord came to them in Acts 2 verse 4, calling tongues of fire, set up on each of them. The Bible says the sound came from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, calling tongues of fire, set up on each of them, and they began to speak with tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. And if that's not your experience, your experience is inconsistent with what the Bible teaches. You know, when the Holy Ghost gets a hold of you, people can't tell whether this is God or alcohol. <laughs> That's what the book said. They said these people are drunk. Yes, that's what they said. They've been drinking since last night. That's the problem. Yes, yes. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. They, they still got one tied on. That's what they said. Hey, make it plain, sir. Mm. Peter said to them, he stood up. Yes. This man who just Hallelujah. 53 days earlier. Denied that he even knew Jesus. My, my, my. 53 days later, he stands up on the yes. day of Pentecost. Yes. At a gathering of every tongue and nation of yes, people sir. on the face of the earth. Some historians say that there was somewhere between 22 and 45,000 people my. gathered in Jerusalem on that.
tail was pulled, there was no counsel afterwards to discuss what you just said that was wrong. So those people that want to make a difference between, uh, between Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 and 20 and Acts 2, 2 and 38, I beg to differ with you because they had plenty of time to announce their disagreement. Kia stood up and preached, the eleven stood with him, and that's all we need to know. Everybody that was with Jesus agreed with what Peter was saying. So he must have been saying the same thing that Jesus was saying because somebody should have stood up and disagreed with him if that was not the case. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. According to the doctrine, according to the proper way of studying the scriptures. The scriptures go into detail the first time and then they just make allusion to the first time after that. So Acts 2 happens, then Acts 3 happens, and then and then uh, Acts 8 happens, and then Acts 10 happens, and then Acts 16 happens, and then Acts 19 happens. All of those scriptures make allusion to back to the first time that somebody was baptized in the scriptures. And I'm telling you that Paul's baptism was in the name of Jesus Christ. First of all, he was baptized for the remission of his sins. And it was in the name of Jesus because and this is already Acts 9. We already know how people were baptized from Acts 2. Is this a little too doctrinal for people? All right. So by the time we get to him, to his baptism, and, and realize this, that Ananias was instructed to do two things. One, pray for him that he might receive his sight, yes. and pray for him that he, that he might receive the Holy Ghost. And baptize him in the name of the Lord Jesus. By who? Other apostles? No. By Jesus Christ himself. The Bible says the Lord appeared to Ananias in a vision and told him, Go get to Paul because Paul is praying. Uh, yes, yes, yes. No matter what your disagreement is with church people. Pray, pray, pray. No matter how foul your life is. Pray, pray, pray. No matter how foul you may be living.
God told him, don't be afraid of it. Yes. Because I've already told him. Hallelujah. The great things he's going to have to suffer for my name. Hallelujah. I've chosen him. Chosen. You don't know who God has chosen. Trying to poke him 
and get him to go a certain direction. Mm. But Paul was raising up his foot and kicking the point of the stick. <laughs> well, now, it's a different image, but the point is the same. You're only going to do that once or twice. But God was poking him. Even while he was persecuted. My God. Yes, yes, yes. Even while he did not understand what My God was wanting Lord. him to do. Yes, yes. God was still poking him. Trying to get him to go the right direction. Yes, yes. But the problem with the Apostle Paul. What with Saul. Was his vision. And when Jesus met, the, met Saul on the road to Damascus. He did not uh, make him cripple in his feet. What Jesus did was blinded him. Yes. yes. To prove to him that the problem is not where you're going. The problem is not what you're doing. The problem is with your sight. You don't have the vision that you need. Yes, sir. But if we have honored guests, honored guests in this house, 
Yes, sir. Those dishes come out once a year on Christmas Day because we celebrate Jesus. Hey! All right. <laughs> Those dishes were sanctified.
Is that calls why do people say all you have to do is confess with your mouth and believe in your heart? It's because they got it out of Romans chapter 10. There's a couple of problems with applying Romans chapter 10 to people that are not already saved. The first problem is, and hear me about this, the first problem is that the book of Romans, according to Romans chapter 1 and verse number 7, is addressed to those who are called to be saints. Right? So if you are not already saved, the rest of what I'm about to say does not apply to you. That's the first problem. I know, I know it's a sacred cow. The second problem is that the conversation that brought Romans 10, 9, and 10 into being began in chapter 9, verse 1. But the specific item that brought, that brought 10, 9, and 10 uh, to bear begins in chapter 1 of verse 10, where Paul is expressly talking about Israelite people. He is specifically addressing Jewish audiences. He begins by saying, look, my heart is breaking. Because Jewish people want to kill me, a Jew, for preaching and teaching about Jesus. Right. And then and then he goes on further to say, oh, oh let me let me do this. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 13, the Jewish leadership told the soldiers to go tell the Caesar. That they stole the body of Jesus. <laughs> Tell them that y'all fell asleep and they stole his body. That is a thought that is alive right today. Have a conversation with a Jewish person and they will tell you, oh, the resurrection didn't happen because they stole his body. Go on, y'all, go ahead. So, G, so Paul, the Apostle Paul, is telling Jewish people that if you will say with your mouth that God raised Jesus All from right. the dead, All right. not that they stole his body, right. not that he was in a coma, not that he was sleeping yeah. somehow, not that he was something other than absolutely dead. Right way. 
So why are you listening? Know the right way. Hallelujah. Why are you attending? Know the right way. Yes. Why are you listening to other folks talk? Know the right way. And know that right way for yourself. And be able to witness to the right way for yourself. Because I'm going to go back to something that I said in the beginning. Somebody is watching what you have. They may not watch what you say, but they're sure watching what you have. They're not concerned with what's coming out of your mouth.